Great to be home. Great to have one job. Great question. Y'all shoot them away. Curry, did you uh, finalize what the defensive coaching assignments are going sure. to be? Sure. I think it'd be a work in progress at some spots, but you know, Glenn Schumann's going to work primarily with the inside backers. Kevin share outside backers. There'll be times that they meet together. There'll also be times where I'm very involved defensively, and that's kind of the position that I've enjoyed coaching most of my uh, Alabama career was the linebackers. So I'll be working with those guys, with the inside guys, with uh, Coach Schumann, but Kevin also, and then Coach Tucker will be working with the DBs as well as being the defensive coordinator, obviously. Raise your hand if you have a question, we'll get a microphone to you. Just how you said it's great to be home, but just how thankful are you now that you don't have to pull double duty anymore? I cannot explain how well I slept last night. Number one, that we won the national championship at the University of Alabama, and to finish that the right way was a relief. Obviously, we did not perform the way I wanted to perform, but we won the game. And to know that those players achieved what they wanted to achieve, and then to get in this room yesterday and meet with this team, now University of Georgia team, my team. It's uh, Everybody told me that when you got to do that finally and it was the only thing you had to worry about, it would be a great relief burden off your shoulders. And that's what it's been for me. I feel much more relaxed. Got to meet with those guys and uh, have conversation with them. And that's what I've always wanted to do. So it's the first time I really got to do that without something else lingering. Coach, you've only had a couple of them now, but what's a day in the life going to be like? Is it just going to be programmed sun up to sundown, or are you going to have a little bit of downtime? No downtime now. Now's the, the hottest time there is for recruiting. We're getting ready to go back on the road. We're going to attack the road and go see the best players we can and try to build this thing through recruiting, which you have to do. So not a downtime now, but it may feel like a downtime to me from what I've been doing, but every hour I've got, every what waning moment will be on the phone with a uh, – prospect, a support staff member, some kind of role player to make this place as good as we can. Kirby, have you had a chance to assess what your strength and weaknesses are of this program? Have you been able to like, go over the roster uh, prior to going on the road for recruiting? I don't know. Are you talking specifically about positions? Or? Yeah, posi position-wise. Like, are you strong at wide receiver, thin at running yeah, back? Yeah, you know, I, don't, I, I haven't had a good chance. I, I know from playing them offensively more than anything because we had to play them, so I got to observe it, you know. But to pinpoint one area, I, I think it's a whole. We always have to build from the line. It's hard to play good SEC football without great offensive and defensive lines. I think there's a lot of skilled players within a five-hour radius here, but you got to have great O-line and D-lines, and I think that's where we got to start the building blocks to build a great program. To say I know exactly what's here, I'd be lying if I told you I know exactly what's here, especially maybe defensively because I don't get to see those guys as often. A lot of them I got to recruit, so I know a little bit about it from that. But not where I need to, but I do know that we got to go out and get great players, and there's a lot of great players in this area. All right, Coach, a couple weeks ago you said the best thing that could happen to you on the recruiting trail would be winning the national championship at Alabama. Now that that's happened, what is your pitch to guys on the trail the next couple of weeks? You know, I think it's they know coming in that there's a certain standard of excellence that I'm used to, that they're going to be held to. I mean, there's also a standard of expectations that they're going to be held to at the University of Georgia. And if they understand that and they know what the expectation is to be great, to win championships, to do things the right way, to go to the SEC championship, to win the SEC East, when you build all those things with building blocks, you focus on what it takes to get you there, not the actual results. And I think they've seen that product. They've seen me be part of that product for nine years. And I really want them to understand that that's the goals and that's what we want to do. And I think there's proof in the pudding, and we got to use that in recruiting, and we will. You uh, you said at your first news conference you knew that the, the next few weeks were going to be tough, but were there any surprises as you tried to, to juggle the two things? Yeah, I mean, there were time constraints, obviously. And, and I knew what a bowl schedule, what a national championship schedule, what a playoff schedule was like at Alabama. I'd been through all those. I knew it was going to be grueling from that aspect. It's not like there's a lot of free time. But uh, the biggest challenge, again, I would say I said this, I think, when I was in Jacksonville, was hiring the staff, finding time to talk to the people to hire the staff. I'm used to a process to hire a staff where you have a group of people sitting in a room making a decision. 
a lot of these decisions I was forced to make with two or three people as opposed to 10 people. That was the biggest difference and the most trying thing, but I got what I wanted in, in, in all those scenarios and I think put a great staff together, certainly one that's very cohesive and uh, looking forward to working with them. Coach, did Nick Saban say anything to you, giving you any advice after the national championship game on your way out? Yeah, uh, not so much advice. I think the advice he's given me is nine years of experience, you know, and that kind of thing. But the other night, you know, he was very appreciative and supportive, told me any way that he could help me. He wants to keep that relationship open. He's always been that way. He is a developer of young men, developer of coaches, promoter of the game. You know, as many times as I've been with him, he wants to play <coughs> football, same as I do. I mean, it's my lifeline. It's what my father did. I mean, I want football to be better. So he's he's always about the guys who have worked for him being the best they can, being supportive of that. And that's kind of, you know, we left it in a moment after the game. He was very appreciative of me staying and, and helping. And obviously we didn't play real good. So we were, it wasn't fired up about that, but we won the game. So. Kirby, how do you envision the special teams looking with, with Shane heading that up? And can you also talk about the other two uh, offensive uh, since you hired since we last talked to you. Yeah, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the job Shane's done. I've known Shane personally a long time. I think he's a very good recruiter. He's uh, been in the Southeastern Conference, which I think is critical to being able to coach in this league. I think he'll do a good job special teams. I'll be very involved with that, and so will our other staff members. We've got other guys on our staff who, who've worked with those uh, you know, those units as well. Uh, you know, James Coley, I'm assuming you're asking about James. and. You know, he and I have worked together, uh, I think when I was at LSU, my first full-time coaching job, he was a GA. Did an amazing job as a grad assistant. I don't know how many years ago that was, 10, 11, 12 years ago. Did a great job. He's gone on, been really successful. Did some great programs, been with Jimbo. Done a good job out on his own. They got a lot of respect for the job that James does and the person that he is as a recruiter. He's also been very involved with special teams and coached those, and he'll help on those units as well. And then um, Dale McGee, who I had the great fortune of recruiting his high school. Every time I've ever gone to Dale, Dale's high school, I've always followed the respect I had for him as a person, first and foremost. Um, can't tell you how many times Coach Saban and I went through the whole Gabe Wright and Isaiah Crowell process, and we thought, man, this guy is a really reputable person. He's going to be a great college coach one day. He took the steps to do that. He went and worked at Auburn. He went and got his job at George Southern, worked, did a great job recruiting two years. I don't think there's a guy more qualified for this position as far as in the state, well respected as a person, as a coach, has proven himself, and he's done nothing since being here uh, to disappoint me at all. I'm looking forward to, to working with him. He's very energetic, and he's met with all those kids. They really like him. I think it's a great pickup for us. I wanted to ask about some of the assistants that you've hired, their contracts, they've had multi-year deals. How important was that for you to get those guys some extra security? You know, I think there's a misnomer out there among the media and among all the people. I think when you talk to agents and you talk to different people, are multi-year deals great? Sometimes they are. you got to read all the uh, stuff in the contract. I mean, what's the buyout? What's the clauses that come with that? You know, me personally, as a, and you talk to all NFL coaches, a lot of them don't want multi-year deals because it locks them in a lot of times. It's a two-way street. So each guy was dealt with on an individual basis. And I think a lot of those decisions that they made, some of them I made, some of them were mutual agreements. But I didn't always like a multi-year deal, personally as an assistant. If I do my job, I recruit good players, and we win football games, I'm going to have opportunities. Opportunities to create leverage, create movement, create a situation where you can go advance. So sometimes that advancement can be hindered by multi-year deals, depending on the wording. So I was happy that we were able to get a great staff, but each one was dealt with on an individual basis, and I think each one of them got what they wanted. So. <coughs> you said in Phoenix that, uh, you know, you welcomed a, a dual threat quarterback, and you obviously with DeJuan, uh, Deshaun Watson, how difficult it is to defend those guys. Uh, but Jim Chaney seems like he's very much a pro-style uh, guy, and Jacob Eason is obviously uh, a pro-style quarterback. How do you, can Jacob Eason run some of that stuff? Do you install some of that stuff? Does Jim, are you, we you can't recruit games. him now. We yeah. got to win football games. So ultimately we got to do what's best for our offensive system and what we have. So what we have here right now, a situation where we got a quarterback environment, we got to compete to find the best guy for the job. And of the three guys, four guys we've got here, we'll be able to compete and find that out. If 
a dual threat guy comes along that we're going to recruit. I've played against Jim Chaney. I've coached against him. You go back his history at Tennessee, he had some quarterback runs. He had some things where we had to use that. If that's your best way to run the ball is with the quarterback, then you have to use that. Okay. If your best way to run the ball is to hand it to Derrick Henry or hand it to Nick Chubb, then you do that. You do whatever you have to do to win the game. If that becomes a dual threat quarterback, then we cross that bridge when we come to it. Because I do think that creates challenges for the defense. And if you find the right guy, which I agree with you, there's been a lot of good ones come out of the state, then you use that. Okay. You also recruit to the style of quarterback you have, and that allows you to get certain other positions, whether it be running back, receiver, you also recruit to a uh, NFL criteria, an NFL status of can this kid advance and go on to play in the NFL? And more and more dual threat guys are doing that in the NFL. So that's opened the door to it. So will we be open to it? Absolutely. Can Jacob do it? I don't know that right now. Uh, I can't answer that. Kirk, when it comes to recruiting, you've been connected to what people call blueprints. How did you come up with that and what exactly? Well, I didn't come up with any blueprint. Okay? In, in the coaching profession, I think everybody plagiarizes and takes ideas from other people. So I didn't invent any blueprint. And when it comes to recruiting, I think everybody recruits their own individual way. My recruiting style is different than, say, Nick Saban's recruiting style. I have to recruit the way I feel comfortable recruiting and building relationships and bonds with those people and trust is what I like to do. I like spending time with them, getting to know them, bring them in, get them on campus as many times as you can. That's how you develop relationships, and at the end of the day, that's what a person decides where they're going to school on, is the trust they have with that coach. But to say that I have the blueprint or what that blueprint is, I can't specifically put that into words. I think it's something that's kind of intangible at times. You know, with the dead period ending and you going on the road recruiting, um, just how much time will you have with the guys on the roster now to meet with them individually, and how important is that for you to foster those relationships? Yeah, we kind of talked on that subject uh, yesterday. I told each one of them I plan on having meetings, individual meetings, where I sit down and get to meet with each one of those guys probably after signing day, to be honest. But up until then, they've already met with the new strength coach. They're going to meet with their position coaches. I'm going to get to meet with some of them individually as we go along now, the last two days, today and yesterday. But the weekends will be important. Obviously, we have recruits coming in. We'll have a lot of our players involved in that recruitment. So I'll get to be around the players at that time and spend time with them. But getting to know them will be a, a slow process and getting to know them the right way. Because I, I do believe probably 30, 40 percent of them I already had a good relationship with. I knew most of these kids through recruiting. But there's some of them that I haven't that I'll get to spend time with and get, and get a better situation with moving forward. Coach, I know uh, a lot of times we have these coaches come in, they talk about changing the culture of the program. Is that something you think you and your new staff are going to have to do to a certain extent? Absolutely. I mean, I think culture is very important anytime you take on a new Not that anything was completely broken here before, but this culture has to be created by Coach Smart and Coach Smart staff. And we're doing that right now. We're doing that in the weight room day one. We're going to make sure every kid understands that. And it's a tough, competitive culture. But it's going to be done through our eyes, our window. And that's what we want to establish in the offseason. It's the whole point of the offseason. Create toughness to make kids being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And I think that's important for them to do. And I had to do it as a coach. And I think when you step outside that box, it makes you a better person. So we're going to challenge these kids to be comfortable being uncomfortable. In your meeting with, with players yesterday, I'm, I'm curious if you brought up spring football practice. And, and if so, can you share anything about maybe what you told them about no, uh, we didn't get in-depth about spring practice, not, nothing like that. This was a general meeting. This was more of a get-to-know-you meeting and uh, spend time with them. We went over and, 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 and ate with those guys in the, in the environment they did each day, just getting to be around them. But it was not specific to spring practice. We won't broach the spring practice until a little bit further down the road. Well, well if, I, if I can ask, uh, you, how much do you, you know, base your evaluations on film and what you've seen, you know, from – uh, your experience before, or is it going to be completely a, a, a blank slate for players yeah, to make their first impressions? For players here, yes, yeah. That we'll, we'll we'll watch tape in the coming weeks, especially after signing day of these players, and get to see them in their games. Absolutely, we will be able to do that. But again, a lot of this is a clean slate from the perspective of they're starting in the weight room new, they're starting academically new. It's got a fresh slate with all of us. But what they've laid out on tape is on tape. That's your resume as a player, not your resume as a person. So we'll obviously, a lot of our coaches have already watched that. The ones who've been hired and been in-house, 
they had through bowl games to watch that and evaluate that. I haven't had that luxury, to be honest. Good. That's something that I look forward to being able to do and watch and observe. Coach, you've been able to face the offense here and have good success. What does this offense need to you to, to go forward to be better? Do you think this Georgia offense? Sure. You know, say I've faced it and had success. You know, we, we, we had our complications when we were in the SEC championship game. They moved the ball really well on us. You know, so we haven't always had ultimate success. I do think that in this program, this university, you're always going to be able to recruit talented tailbacks, running backs. So you want to be able to run the football because you can't win football games if you can't run it. If you can only run it, you will lose football games too. You've got to be able to have balance, which is why we hired the staff we hired. I think it creates a great balance using a guy like Coley who's been in a lot of different passing systems, coached in the NFL, been around Jimbo, done some things. He and Chaney have some similar lineage. They've both been around uh, Scott Linehan, who's a great offensive mind. So you got to have balance. You say, what's the one thing we got to be able to improve? We've got to be able to throw the ball better than what we've done in the past here. And I think we can do that with the people we have here. And we've got to improve the offensive line. We've got to get bigger people. We've got to get more depth. We've got to be able to survive a couple injuries because they're going to happen. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. So you've got to be able to survive those. There's a lot of areas to improve on. We've got to improve on defense too. All that can be done through recruiting and the weight room. And that's what we're focused on right now. How do you envision your uh, off-season uh, Stanford edition <coughs> program looking, and uh, how did you know those guys that you brought in? Well, I, I, first, how do I envision it looking? I envision it looking very detailed, very organized. We're going to structure it in a way that I'm comfortable with, and Scott, Scott and I sat down and talked about that. That was part of the uh, interview process, and that's probably what intrigued me most about him. He is very uh, personal. He enjoys being around the players. He thinks that if you get to know them, they will work hard for you. And they'll buy into that. And I, I believe in that. We had a lot of sim a lot of similar beliefs. We also had a lot of similar uh, people we worked with. Guys I've worked with at Alabama that worked with him prior to. Very reputable guy. Very good reputation. He did a very good job at uh, Marshall. And uh, felt very strongly that he was the right guy to hire. And then Ed coming with him made a great tandem. Because those two have worked together before and done really good things. And I like what they produced. I like what... They've been able to develop players at places they, they're at to play on the pro level. The guy in Central Florida, a lot of the former players there called me and reached out to me. So I felt really good about those guys. In terms of support staff, I mean, it, I, I, none of those things have been officially announced other than, than uh, the, the recruiting guy. But, but do you plan on expanding there? I mean, is, that, is that a department here that's going to grow um, from what it was previously? I think in today's day and age college football, that's where the most growth has come. You know, every school's trying to take advantage of support staff every way they can. What role can they play? What will the NCAA allow them to do? And try to maximize those benefits. We're going to try to do that every way we can. The administration here has been very supportive of me in those roles, getting people in those roles, trying to fill them. Uh, at whatever point we start to hire those guys, you know, we'll be able to release it. But for me, I want to do it the right way. I don't want to rush into hiring somebody in one of those roles and not feel comfortable with them. But I do think there'll be a little bit of expansion there, and the, and the administration will be supportive of that. Yeah, I guess the good news is you got an indoor practice facility on the way. And I understand, I understand <laughs> nobody else in the country has a $30 million indoor practice facility. The bad news is how that's going to affect you logistically. What, what's, what's your understanding on that? How's that going to affect things? What do you think about just reaping kind of the benefits of that? Yeah, I, I think that you almost got to take a step back and take two steps forward. And obviously there's going to be some uh, logistical issues of which I don't even know all of them yet, Chip. I mean, I don't know exactly. what I'll, I know it's going to incur some problems with practice and things like that. But I'm 100% on board with that to get the indoor. So I mean, you're not going to hear me complain about having to travel <laughs> to get that. I mean, I'm, I'm all on board with that. And I'm really fired up about it. I've seen the plans for it. And I think a lot of thought and uh, mindset went into that to, to go to the right way. And you want to do that because once once you got it, it's yours. It's your baby. And you want it to be done the right way. Logistically, you know, I think it's going to create some problems for the first season. But I do think that we can overcome that and they're willing to do it. And, uh, and as we incur those, you obviously know about it. Heard something that caused a lot of consternation around here uh, is the drug policy. Um, did you have any discussions with Greg, Jerry, 
about that? Uh, do you have any understanding about whether it's staying the same or changing? Yeah, I don't get, to me, to be honest with you, the drug program is above me. It's a decision that's top down, managed, and you know, President Moorhead approached me with that and discussed it and told me exactly what it was, but I'm understanding of that. I mean, that's something that ultimately falls beyond my control, and right now, that's, that's where we're at with it. I mean, I'll be honest with you, Greg addressed it, and so did uh, President Moorhead, and I'm completely understanding of that and, and realize that it's not exactly a level playing field across the board, but we come in knowing that. We know what the issues are, and we know what the decisions are. We know what the program is here. The kids know what they are. So as long as you know that and understand it, then you don't break the rules. You don't break the law. You don't break the rules of the program. And if you do, then you'll be punished for it. And I think they've got a pretty good understanding of that here. Kirby, uh, you touched on the support staff uh, probably going to increase that. Some. Are there any other operational things that you've noticed? And obviously, you're still probably taking it all in as far as differences here as opposed to Alabama that you'd like to bring in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, Alabama has the largest staff in any capacity that I've ever seen. So I don't know that that's a fair comparison sometimes when it comes to just pure staffing. Um, but a lot of those issues have been addressed through the last couple of weeks, and I think they will be addressed in coming weeks with hiring people and, and developing a staff. But to say that it's going to be as large as theirs or comparable to theirs, I don't know that that's necessarily true there. I, they they want to do everything we can to win here and everything that I think we need. They adhere to and they, they, they've been on board with it. They want to win. And I think that's the important part, and I think you should win there. And I think that part of doing that is hiring the best people you can hire in those roles. Do I think you need every one of those roles? No, I don't think. I mean, I'm there for nine years. I don't think you need every one of those roles. But I certainly think that uh, we got to develop that. And they're on board with that, and we've started in that process. You'll see that come to fruition, I think, in the coming months. But to say that I'm going to run out right now and hire somebody right before I go recruiting, I'm not comfortable with that either. I'm kind of like, I want to get this done right the first time, even if it takes a little longer to get done. With implementing a new culture, do you have to almost anticipate that some guys are going to say, this isn't for me, yeah. I'm out, or do you just kind of take it as it goes? No, I, I think you take it as it goes, but you accept that's probably going to happen. You know, I don't know that anybody, all the people I've talked to who've taken head jobs and dealt with that first transition, change in culture, there's going to be kids who felt they were so loyal to that coach or that staff or some staff member that they feel like they need to take a chance to go look somewhere else. But our job is to convince them that we're here for them too, to build that relationship, to make sure they know that they're part of this family. They chose to come to the University of Georgia for a reason. We want to make those reasons the same. We want to have a relationship with them. But is it inevitable? I do think it's inevitable. I do think that when you change the culture, sometimes people don't fit that culture and they may elect to leave. You know, and, and there's, there's regrets about that. You know, it affects your APR, it affects your graduation rate long term. But at the end of the day, they've got to decide what's best for them, and we can't sacrifice our goals and culture for one player. So, last question. I was going to kind of along the same lines. Has there been any uh, attrition? I guess Jonathan Abram talked to uh, uh, that going to anyone else uh, decided to. That I'm aware of right now. Um, you know, I, I, we actually recruited Jonathan Abram to Alabama, and actually called the guys here at Georgia and told them he was a really good player that. Didn't know if we were going to be able to take at all, so I had a relationship with him and encouraged him to stay. But you know, he's got personal and family issues that he's having to deal with, and right now it's the best thing for him. But as far as I know, as of right now, that's all we're dealing with. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot.